Before I move on to Tablet 2 and start working on the interpretation there, I want to cover a couple more things that were left in the beginning of Tablet 1. This is for mainly for the people that are just looking through these and looking for patterns and taking a broad look at things. Um, there were a couple of things in there that I wanted to talk about, but they they require a little bit of time on their own to talk about, so I didn't do it in that video. I didn't want to tie that up, but I want to do it here. This Again, it's specifically for those that are like, I want to dig this material apart. We already know what the answers are, but I think that this is where we're learning that they are teaching it. Again, we're looking at all of the material as much as possible and looking for patterns. And then when we spot those patterns, we stop and analyze them, knowing that they play out in the psyche and understand what teaching that they are um, containing as a result of that mental analysis process. We're reverse engineering their technique for story building. And this one very specifically is the very beginning. Uh, what I'm gonna do is just read that. This is how we come about. However, it's dense, so let's let's spend a little time looking at a couple of things here. What I want to do is look at the very beginning and see how this creates us. At a time when even the glories above had yet to be named, and ununttered was the word for the world which lay beneath, it was then that the first being Apsu, who was their source, and the progenitor Tiamat, the mother who gave birth to all, intermingled their waters, producing neither field nor marsh. At a time when no divine beings had yet come into existence, there were no names to be spoken and no fates pronounced, but the gods were given birth within those intermixing waves. All right, at the upper right is that asterisk. Let's go ahead and follow that and see what that note says. It says, compare with two Estras, 6-4, before the measures of the firmament were named. Okay, again, so we're going to find a lot of people, uh, yeah, there's a lot of comparisons. There's a lot of people spotting similarities, and there, you won't find any shortage of them once you start going through the material. I'm going to go ahead and read um, that from Second Esdras. I'm going to get from the NRSV with Apocrypha. And so it is in here, right in one source. And I'll set this up. Esdras, there's Ezra is going through this same experience, Ezra on the path. And at this point, he's imploring the Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, show your servant through whom you will visit your creation. So Ezra is asking, how do I get here? Your creation is what? That's us. And cryptically, it, the whole, uh, I'll read this whole section right here, a number of verses. He said to me, at the beginning of the circle of the earth, before the portals of the world were in place, and before the assembled winds blew, and before the rumblings of thunder sounded, and before the flashes of lightning shone, and before the foundations of paradise were laid, and before the beautiful flowers were seen, and before the powers of movement were established, and before the innumerable hosts of the angels were gathered together, and before the heights of the air were lifted up, and before the measures of the firmaments were named, and before the footstool of Zion was established, and before the present years were reckoned, and before the imaginations of those who now sin were estranged, and before those who stored up treasures of faith were sealed. Then I planned these things, and they were made through me alone, and not through another, just as the end shall come through me alone, and not through another. I don't want to spend a lot of time interpreting that right there, but we can see the elements are there, that there is actually, this is about us again, that this is how we start our world, our creation, the creation of us as an individual. And the realm that is the Lord's is our higher self combined with, I mean, when we're, when we've got nirvana, our, um, in this case, the kingdom of heaven within or whatever, whatever they're seeking in this case, they're seeking a, something different. But it's, uh, it's, they're all going to be analogous for that happy place. The mental state of being where you're okay. However, I'm going to suggest an easier place to dig into this one and to look at it. I'm going to pry into it a little bit more using the Tao Te Ching from, um, this is the Stefan Mitchell translation. I'll just grab it real quick. And here's what we have. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. 
The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The unnameable is the eternally real. Naming is the origin of all particular things. That is the very first, that is the beginning of the Tao Te Ching. And this one is going to be more simpler to sink our teeth into. Then we can take that and go back and look at the, the other ones that are going to be teaching the same thing, but have the layering density added to them. So we'll be able to extract the teaching easier by learning it from some place where, where we can find access to the template mentally. So the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. Where I'm going to hook into this is the next line. The unnameable is the eternally real. Naming is the origin of all particular things. Naming is the origin of all particular things. That spot, we know exactly where that is. When you name something is when you judge something, when you decide what it is, when you have a mental experience in life that you comprehend to the degree that you put a, an emotional state to the memory that happens. If you're disconnected from it, you don't have that happen. If you have something happen, though, that is um, hurtful, that is going to be something that you've named. As soon as you classify it, as soon as you name it, it's going to be something that naming is the origin of all particular things. That is when it becomes something in you, when you decide what it is. And deciding what it is isn't just good or bad. It's, a, it's really anything that keeps you from being happy. Again, clinging, desire. You might not have ever had anything bad happen, but you just feel bad about yourself. You um, Somehow something, you feel like you are lacking, wanting something, you don't feel fulfilled. All of that is a part of what happens to us when we begin to name those things. Naming is the origin of all particular things. We can see it in Jesus' work right in the beginning. Judge not, lest you be judged. For the judgment with which you judge unto others will be likewise meted unto you. Something to that effect. Same lesson. When you're judging something, this isn't a physical teaching. You can judge something out there and, and maybe, maybe you have an effect on it, maybe not. It, it should work. It's a good lesson, but it's not a guarantee. Once you play it in the psyche, it is a guarantee. It's the same lesson. You have now, instead of named something, you've judged something. I judge that as good or bad. And now, as a result of that, the measure with which you've judged that is going to continue to play out. So we're seeing that this judging, this naming, this classifying is how we come about. We can hook into that lesson right there. So if I feel like I am tied into that point, naming is the origin of all particular things, that means right there in my life, that is where I fit in my consciousness and begin to make decisions about what I'm going to... Though we're not doing this consciously. We are unconsciously living life, putting away experiences, and they're, they're letting us know, yeah, that's what happened to you. Um... So the unnameable is the eternally real. If naming is the origin of all particular things, then the unnameable is the eternally real. That means that before we started naming things, reality comes from what is unnameable. That is always real. That is there. Backing it up, the name that can be named is not the eternal name. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. It gets a little nebulous right there, but I know it is prior to where I can hook into so this is something that's happened before I come into existence anyway. It's, it's good to know. It's good to understand, perhaps. But right now, naming is the origin of all particular things. Right there is where I am picking up my life issues. Before that, however it got here, I don't know. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. I guess if you name something, it, it is not, it is no longer eternal. So yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? In a in a cryptic way. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. Don't let anybody tell you that that right there means that you can't understand this. There are people out there that read this, Westerners, that go, ooh, look at that right there. There you go. You can read this and study this, and it's beautiful, but you can never understand it. <laughs> Don't follow them. It's, that is, um, what is that? That's the cryptic carrier. That's how you get people to carry it around. Ooh, it's magical, mystical. Okay, so right there, I feel very comfortable with the idea that the teaching starts off letting me know that the, the emergence of who and what I am 
is based on the mental processes that I'm putting into play that have to come in from my conscious and my subconscious at a time in my development when I can start doing that. There's a time prior to my development when I can't. In infancy, I can't make a judgment call. As an infant, I could see a house burning down and I wouldn't think anything of it. You don't have the processes in there to to judge something as good or bad yet. We have that part of us early on where we, where we existed, but we were not yet becoming what we were. We hadn't started judging things yet. Okay, so in simplest form, yeah, there's a point where we have learned enough that we can start making judgment calls about what is good and bad, and there's a point before that when we haven't done so. There's lots of potential. Let's go back to tablet one and see what we can come out, um, get out of here. At a time when even the glories above had yet to be named, and unuttered was the word for the world which lay beneath. First, let's cover a couple of things. We have two terms, above and beneath. Glories above, world beneath. Glories above, <laughs> world beneath. What are we looking at there? What we're going to see is that there is an inside and an outside here. This is the same as up or down, in and out. Um, we have a spiritual inside of us, mental, and we have a physical world out there. This is at a time when the glories above had yet to be named. So at a time before the things in the world that exist were something that we named, before we became aware of what they were, and unuttered was the word for the world which lay beneath. Our um, unuttered was the word. The word is naming something, right? When we name something, we're deciding what it is. And ut unuttered was the word for the world which lay beneath. It didn't exist. Yeah, um, not yet. Not in the beginning. We're just that consciousness. It was then that the first being Apsu was their source. That is us. That is our consciousness. And the progenitor Tiamat. Now our female part is coming on. The mother who gave birth to all. She's going to give birth to all, but she's going to do that in conjunction with Apsu, the consciousness. Okay, so this then looks to me like it's decoding at this point as we start off and we are, we exist, but we're not aware. We haven't learned. We haven't developed. We are just a mind ready to go with potential. You can become anything that a human can become. The potential to grow is there. Then what happens is that as we begin to name things, as we learn the, uh, above, the, um, the above world, as we learn what things are, as we grow and develop, our conscious and our subconscious somehow begin to emerge together or the subconscious emerges as a result of the conscious learning, the repetitive this is red, this is red, this is red, until you realize, you know, at some point you, you understand it's a color, that it's, a, it's red. There's complexity that has to grow into us. That is what is happening. And during the time of the growth of that complexity, we are emerging from that. Who and what we are that is going to control our lives are emerging from that. And then the line up here about intermingled their waters, producing neither field nor marsh. This is going to appear in a few other places. It looks a little strange to me. Why would it say that? Those are both physical things though, right? Intermingled their waters, producing neither field nor marsh. This is telling us that as these two, whatever these two things are intermingling and creating is not in the physical world, is not in the physical world. But the gods were given birth within those intermixing waves. So this whole, yeah, this whole thing here is about us at the beginning of our life and how we come about. And it's very clear on that, actually, if I pick it apart like that. Let's go back and look at um, two Esdras 6 again, this part right here. He said to me, 
At the beginning of the circle of the earth, before the portals of the world were in place, and before the assembled winds blew, and before the rumblings of the thunder sounded, and before the flashes of lightning shone, and before the foundations of paradise were laid, and before the beautiful flowers were seen, and before the powers of movements were established, and before the innumerable hosts of angels were gathered together, and before the heights of the air were lifted up, and before, and it goes on that way, so I don't have to continue. This is doing the same thing. It's just using different analogs. It's using religious analogs to carry the same teaching, so we have to extract ourselves from any mental commitments that are going to prevent us from accessing what this actually says. And what does it say if we go back and look at Tablet 1 at a time when even the glories above had yet to be named? What are they doing here? They're just going through the list and naming a bunch of them. It's the same thing. Ezra's story in to Ez- Ezra <laughs> is um, it's a version of the same teaching, but not in a creation myth, but it shows the creation that's in there. And again, you can see that, it, you know, instead of just saying before everything was named, it's going on and saying before this was named, before that was named, before this was named, before the four winds, before the... It could have been said succinctly by just saying before anything was named. One of them is a larger vehicle in a different style, but they're both carrying that same lesson. If you've watched some of my other videos, I've talked before about this miracle of feeding fish in loaves and having more left over when you're done. And that when that plays out in the psyche, what it means is that as you're teaching, as you're providing, um, as you're teaching this knowledge, you get more. And that happened in this video. I want to go back to the Tao Te Ching for a second. I have taught this for a long time, (laughs) or a couple of years. And I've got a lot of videos up, and I don't have this nailed down ever. That one, And I even mentioned earlier people yeah, that tell you that it means it can't be understood. I never understood what it meant. It stayed nebulous. I just nailed it. Let's take a look at it. For the first time ever, I see a pattern here that I didn't see before, (laughs) that I've never seen before. There's a sequence going on, but it is very cleverly hidden in the verbiage. And it might have just, this is English, maybe in Chinese, in the original um, Mandarin or whatever the language was that this was written in, it may have come out better. But here's, look at this for a second. I'm going to suggest we're going to see duality emerge out of here. It is a common technique in the teaching. Buddha starts right off in his verses with the dual verses. This, then that. This, then that. Or if that, then this. Or if that, then that. He's teaching what to do at the same time while combining verses that one says to do it one way. The other says, don't do it and you'll get these results. Which is teaching the right thing to do from both sides of the coin, showing that there's duality going on. Number one, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. That's the way it sequences. Then it goes to the unnameable is the eternally real. Naming is the origin of all particular things. Let's mix these up. Pardon the crude graphics, but what I'm going to do is take the two black lines and put them together and the two red lines and put them together. All right. Like everything else, it's just going to require a detailed analysis of what they're talking about in each one of the lines. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. Let's take a look at that. The Tao, what is the Tao? The Tao is the way of life. Um, In teachings like in Buddhism, we're looking for nirvana. When you don't have nirvana, you've got something different. In Jesus' teachings, we're looking for the kingdom of heaven within. And when you're not there, you've got something different. All of them are that way. The Tao is encompassing both of those. The Tao is whatever your life is. You want a good life, but your life is however it flows. The Tao is the flow, the way, the way life unfolds for you when you play it out in the psyche. I'm not doing this as a Taoist. So, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. If we look at everything else that we've been doing, the Tao is going to be kind of the the cosmic energy, when we function, when we live life, whatever there is that flows through us, that gives us our capacity to accomplish, comes through our filters. And when you talk about the Tao, you're naming it. When you've told the Tao, when you're saying what 
things are what ways are, you're actually naming. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. We can change that to the way that can be named is not the eternal way. The way that can be named is not the eternal way. The next line, the unnameable, is the eternally real. It just is the opposite exactly of what that first line says. Let's, let's dissect these into something that's a little bit more understandable verbiage. The first line is what is named is not eternal. What is unnamed is eternal. And then for the next one, naming creates who you become. If you name the experiences, they are fixed in the manner that you name them. They are no longer eternal and available for whatever. They are now fixed in that manner. And that helps dictate your way, your flow, your Tao. Okay, check this out. I'm going to leave them interpreted that way, but then put them back in the order that they had them. And let's read it again with our verbiage, but in their way. What is named is not eternal. If you name the experiences, they are fixed in the manner you named them. Naming creates who you become. What is unnamed is eternal. See how they obfuscate that? <laughs> what? How tricky. Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, play around with them. Blocks, patterns. You see it's mechanical. Let's go back one more time to Tablet 1. At a time when even the glories above had yet to be named. So at a, at a time in our life when... All of the world, we didn't understand the world yet. We hadn't, we hadn't developed our consciousness to the point of being able to tell. And unuttered was the word for the world which lay beneath. There was nothing in our psyche either. We were just um, a block of life. <laughs> I don't know how to describe that. It was then that the first being Apsu, who was their source, and the progenitor Tiamat, the mother who gave birth to all, intermingled their waters, producing neither field nor marsh. So we're turning inward, and we are starting to intermingle, and no divine beings, which are going to be important later, we'll leave that now, have not come into existence. However, there were no names to be spoken and no fates pronounced. At this point in time, we're pure. Everything is still okay right here. We've learned of a very good viability of naming being a term used to describe when we are deciding what our life experience is. So with no names being spoken, we haven't done that, and no fate's pronounced. No, The fate would be a result of the name. When we've named something, this is a cycle happening here as well. No fate's pronounced. Once, Yeah, yeah, see that? And hey, let's stop here and play with this for a second. There were no names to be spoken and no fates pronounced. This should, when, when your brain wires far enough along, you can see a lot of things that it sounds like. And this one right here is going to sound like there were no names to be spoken and no fates pronounced. Judge not, lest he be judged. There were no names spoken, judge not. No fates pronounced, lest he be judged. There were no names to be spoken. No judgment had been made. And no fates pronounced. Therefore, judgment was not coming back. Do you see it? But the gods were given birth within those intermixing waves. Intermixing waves, creation. Intermixing waves, cycles. We got cycles happening right there. Intermixing is when they cross. It takes two things coming together to create something else. If you think about all of the issues that you have, you will find out that it's because of you and something else. Somebody, some perception, a situation, something. It took two things to make it happen. The gods were given birth within those intermixing waves. Okay, I feel better about the beginnings of Tablet 1 after this supplement. Hope it was helpful. Love one another. See you in the next video.